Well, good morning. Please pass your cards inside out. They'll be picked up at this time. I remember years ago reading this from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson talking about the task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us. Uh, I remember also that, uh, if I can get this up here, going by a, a church building that had a sign on the billboard that said, the task ahead of us is never as great as the power within us. Uh, they had changed that from... Uh, uh, within instead of behind and this is a, a even though it's accredited to Emerson the truth of the matter is it's a biblical concept we're going to get to that a little bit later on aren't you all so excited we're going to get to that idea about the task ahead of us is never as great as the power that's within us of course I think we all certainly believe that uh, that one sentence I believe sums up the entire scope of the word of God from the beginning of time, from Adam all the way through, God kept trying to tell the people, the task ahead of you is never as great as the power that's within you. Or he that is within you, we could even, uh, it's what scripture says, again we'll get to that a little bit later on. But uh, uh, the, the question is, not whether or not this is truth, but whether or not we accept it and live it. You see, that's the bottom line. We can we can spew and spout all we want to about the truth of what Scripture has to say, but the reality of it is that doesn't make any difference at all. Truth is truth whether we live it or not. The bottom line is, do we live it? And so as we look at this, it speaks of God's greatness as well as to our number one need of having God in our lives. I appreciate Andy's prayer earlier because certainly we live in a a nation and in a world that's trying its best, that's bent on forgetting God, walking away from God. Now, uh, not all of us, naturally, but I'm talking about that certain segment of society that just doesn't seem to care. And so, uh, this is our number one need, and a lot of people don't see that. The, the truth of the matter is, there isn't any disease or power on earth that can alter the eternal outcome of a faithful child of God. Now, I want to reiterate that. I don't care what disease it is. I don't care what, what power on this earth or what government decree is given. For those Christians who are faithful to the Word of God and to the commandments of Almighty God, there isn't any disease or power on this earth that's going to alter the outcome of a faithful Christian, the eternal outcome. What does that mean? That means if you want heaven badly enough and are willing to comply to the word of God, heaven can be yours. If you want something else, if heaven doesn't interest you, you're going to pay the eternal price for that. That's the bottom line. And he's trying to get us to see that what great evangelists, evangelists, what great examples would be to the world if more people would live each and every single day as though they believe what the Word of God tells us about what lies ahead of us in comparison to He who is in us. The Bible talks about, I don't have time to get into that today, it's another sermon another time, but talks about God being in us, Christ being in us, the Holy Spirit being in us. And of course, I, I personally believe that's all through the Word. Uh, other people disagree, but uh, however, we all understand those things are, are true. God in us, Christ in us, Holy Spirit in us. And uh, as we look at these things and see about how God would have us to live, let us understand what John was saying. John, the author of five books in the New Testament, uh, the book of John, first and second and third John, and the book of Revelation. He says this, By this we know that we abide in Him. You see, the question is not whether God will abide in the, in the child of God, because we know that's a no-brainer, it's what Scripture says. But how do we know that we're abiding in God? It tells us here. 
By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. Now watch carefully verse 14. And we have seen and testify. That means we stand before the world. And we witness, if you will, it's not like a, a, a denominational witnessing concept where you get up and tell everybody about your life, but it's about the way we live our lives. And through the way we live, we are witnesses. We testify before the people, and by the way we speak also. We testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses, now I want us to understand this word, you know, the, the literal concept of what this is meaning. The idea of whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God doesn't mean just to mouth those words. It, is a, it denotes a manner, a way of life. We live it. We believe it. We breathe it. Living for Jesus has become an automatic reflex, just like breathing is. As certain as we breathe in and out air, that oxygen that we need to sustain our physical life, we take in the idea of the Word of God, that, that spiritual oxygen, the breath of God. And it's an automatic reflex. Things arise. Things happen. And what do we do? Well, we understand what the Word of God has to say, and we're going to live that. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. That manner of life, the way we live, he goes on to say this, John does, in verses 16 through 18. So we have come to know, have that relationship with the Word of God, and to believe the love that God has for us. I believe that is a, a, a misconception that a lot of people have in their lives. The misconception is the uncertainty of whether God loves them. We ought to wake up every morning knowing that. And it's not just a, a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it is a fact that the Bible tells us. We believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Now watch. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Wow. This is telling us the task ahead of us is never as great as the power, is not greater than the power that's within us. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, no temptation has been given to us, has befallen man, that we can't say no to that, walk away from it. But here is the beauty of what's being said. Because as He is, in the last part of verse 17, so also we are in this world. Talking about Christ, talking about love. I believe talking about the fear. This is proof positive that a child of God on this earth should never fear what's coming. Should never fear what this world's going to hand down to us. Or never fear about whether or not heaven is real. Because it goes on and it says... There is no fear in love. If your love is indeed the true love for God, you're not going to have any fear of what's coming. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. So for those of you who are in Christ, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love, for those of you who are in Christ, the bottom line is, you ought to walk every day with your, held, with your head held high, not haughty, not braggadociously. Not that you are better than anybody else. But your head is held high because you know to whom you belong. And you know that you are weak and frail and oftentimes fail in this old world. But you belong to Him who is perfect. And therefore, since you belong to Him and you know about His power... And the resurrection power that's coming, Philippians 3 and verse 10 and following. That there's no fear as you walk the streets of this world. It doesn't matter about what the world does. Now listen to this. In confidence, we talk about this, both the relying and the confidence are joined together by our love for God. 
And you think about this. this people think this is, a, this is haughty, that we should never say this. Oh, Brother Jack, I know that we are, are saved people, but we shouldn't tell people we're saved people because they'll get the wrong idea. Rubbish. Well, what are we supposed to tell people? Hey, we're not saved people. Come and join us. What are we going to say? Of course we love the Word of God. We have the power of God in us and everything that, that God wants to, uh, to invest in us. If we are children of God, we have that. We have purpose in our lives. We look at one another. We love each other. We challenge each other. We are examples to each other. We realize on this earth that if we go down a wrong path, once we become children of God and we start marching in a wrong path, families are affected. Amen? Children and grandchildren are affected. The church is affected and oftentimes infected. Now what are we saying? We walk free from the stains of this world. Understanding what God would have us to be. This is what Paul's addressing in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 20. He's addressing the elders in Ephesus and he tells them of his own personal problem that he had, his own personal task. And what he is doing is he is saying nothing's going to deter me from doing what God would have me to do. Listen to what Paul says. He says in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 through 24. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, compelled by the Spirit, NIV says not knowing what will happen to me there. Wow. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Notice what Paul saying, in church. I'm going where God is leading me. Romans 8 and verse 14 through 16 says we're led by the Spirit. Now, I believe God opens up doors and it's our choice to walk through them or to ignore them. I believe our, our faith is tested. The book of James says that, James 1, James 2. God does not tempt anyone to sin. That's James 1 and verse 13. But we are tested. Life is a test. Have you noticed that? It's the ultimate test. And Paul goes on to say in verse 24, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. He says, My life, life or death, means nothing. What means something, if only I may finish my course, which he says, remember 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, through about verse 8. Remember what he says? I have fought the fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. He goes on to say here, no value, nor is precious to myself, if only I, am, I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He says, let me have the willpower to understand that my life is to be used for the cause of Almighty God, period. When people see me, they're to see Jesus. That's what Paul was saying. He said, for me to live is to be Christ, be like Christ, to live my life like Christ. For me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. Look at Philippians 1, 21 and following. And he was having a, a great battle. Philippians also tells us, Paul says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. I don't know whether it's better for me to stay here to be with you and preach the word of God or to go on to be with the heavenly father where he is. He was battling that. Paul says, I have confidence that whatever the task is ahead of me, it's never going to be as great as the power within me. What power was he talking about? His own power? No, we're going to see that a little bit later on. But the power of Almighty God because he knew where he was going. You realize that, church? That's what Paul is saying. Keep your head about you. Keep your wits about you. There are going to be opportunities to sin every single day of your life. You're never going to wake up to a day that will not give you chances to sin. You're not going to face one of those days. Hello, church? Is that real? You ever face today in all of your adult life, all of your accountable age life, where you didn't have a chance to sin if you wanted to? It's there. You're never going to face a day 
You're not going to have a chance to say yes to Almighty God and to avoid sin. But in saying those two things, those two true biblical concepts, sin is going to be there chasing you every single day. The chance to say no to sin and live for God and live that right life is going to be there each and every day. Notice in that the choice is up to us. And we realize we can walk away from it or we can be involved in it. I like that picture. The cat sees himself as a lion, you see. We should all want this attitude in our lives if it isn't there already that Paul had. Paul realized we all have promises, power, and potential from the Word of God. Let me say that again. We all have promises, power, and potential from the Word of God. I don't mind telling you, I'm 65 years of age. I'm not as well as I used to be. But I am so stubborn in a holy way. I believe my best preaching is ahead of me. The congregation says, I hope so. I don't know why you're laughing about it. I didn't think that was funny at all. But seriously. I believe that. You know, we have, we have promises, power, and potential. We get to choose, as I often say, whether we're going to focus on living or dying. Right? We get to make that choice in our lives. Oh, woe is me. Look what's been handed down to me. Or we can take the challenge and say, whatever life I have left, we're going to live for Almighty God. Period. And realize what lies ahead of us. What should motivate every child of God, every single breath we take, is precious. And if we look at these things, what should motivate us? What should make us who we happen to be? Because of the certainty of who God is and the promises He who is perfect has made to us. I cannot force any person here to be baptized into Christ. Wouldn't that be easy? Preachers, pull out the pistols and hold your audience captive until everybody obeys. The problem is, probably have people here to shoot back. So it doesn't work that way. It works whenever honest people with honest hearts realize they honestly need Almighty God in their lives and they get out of that stubborn idea of who they are and what they want, get into the Word of God and say, God, mold me and make me. Whatever you say, it's what I want to be. Because, God, I'm looking forward to the place, Hebrews chapter 11, a far better place than this earth. That's the way we ought to live our lives. Perfect time for you to have said amen, but that's all right. You'll catch on later. Because of this, Paul can motivate others like those in Corinth to have confidence. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. In other words, When you're marching with Jesus Christ, you're never wrong. You're always going to be blessed. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We're to even smell like Jesus. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. To want a fragrance from death to death because they're never going to take any advantage of that. And to the other a fragrance from life to life, who is sufficient for these things. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's Word, out just to preach the Word of God for benefit or whatever, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. He says, we're not out here just not taking the Word of God seriously, somebody trying to peddle the Word of God and tell you what you want to hear. And there's enough of that going on around the world. It's the problem that the world has. A lot of people don't like to be challenged. A challenge, especially a biblical challenge, listen to me, church, listen to me. A challenge, especially a a biblical challenge, makes cowards out of most people. 
because they're not willing to take that challenge. The challenge is say no to the world and yes to Almighty God. Say yes to His Word and what it says, regardless what it says. So it makes cowards out of a lot of people. It's what Paul is telling the church, basically at Corinth. We're to be ambassadors for Christ. Verse 16 asks us, who asks, who is sufficient for these things? In the NIV, it mentions it this way, who is equal to the task? Who's equal to the task? And how are we equal to that task? This is about being sincere about the souls of men and our being ambassadors of Christ and taking that seriously. What it means is, we here on this earth have been more or less sentenced to a world, a a foreign place called the world, foreign place it should be to us, to be direct representatives of Christ Jesus to a lost people. That's what we are about. What's an ambassador do anyway? Well, we have ambassadors of the United States going to different countries on our benefit, right? To help do these things in other countries. Let them see our side of these things. And being ambassadors for Christ, we're to live for Him. We understand we're in a, a foreign world. This world, as we sing about, is not our home. Church, we have to catch on to that. And we have to live that. But notice, again, keeping our eyes on our Lord and Savior. In chapter 3, Paul tells us how we're equal to such a task. Who's equal to such a task? Well, watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. That is another bulwark of the faith. Another solid step that we can, you know, on the, the, the ladder, this run, these rungs that we're climbing to get to where we want to go, that we should take seriously. Well, what is it saying to us? This is part of that power that we have. Paul would say in Romans 1 and verse 16, remember? He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first, also to the Greek. The word power there from the word dynamite in the Greek, dunamis, meaning that it is is that, that power that we possess through the word of God, that God enables us to be able to do those things we never thought possible. And in all of that, understanding that it's not our power that's going to accomplish all these great things. But it comes from that which is within us. Notice this. This means, as we've said, the task ahead of us is never as great as the power that's within us. God has given us all the task of being servants. I want to get to that as we're winding down here. Only another hour to go, church, so just relax. 1 Corinthians 3. 5 through 9. The Word of God tells us. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. Now, these are ministers, if you will. Preachers of the Word. Teachers of the Word. I planted, Paul is saying. Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. You see, there was a, a problem at Corinth. The problem was people had preacheritis. I know this congregation doesn't. Praise God for that, but they had preacheritis. In other words, they had their favorite preachers. Nothing wrong with that. Favorite speakers, nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't put the preacher above Jesus Christ. Amen? And so here we have the idea, some were attaching this. I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Apollos. Well, I'm a better Christian than you are because Paul baptized me. Well, no, I'm better than you are because I was baptized. All this, this garbage going on, and Paul just lays it out because of that which the Holy Spirit inspired, inspired him to say. He said, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. When you have done that, not that it's not important, but I want you to understand you've only done what God commanded you to do in the first place. That's what you're supposed to do. He says... He who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. 
Now, boy, I could preach on that for about a month and a half. One in thought and intent and purpose. They are one in mind, one in teaching. This verse teaches us they're about the one faith that's mentioned in Ephesians 4, 4 through about verse 6. The seven ones, especially the one faith. I'll preach on that sometime in the future. But this idea about they are one. They are solid in what they're teaching. They're teaching the same thing, preaching the same thing. They are of one mind. And they're doing this. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are all God's fellow workers. We are all God's fellow workers. The idea of that is we're all to be one just like they are, preaching and teaching the same thing. In the first century, there wasn't any such animal as denominationalism. It wasn't there. Those strong Christians, those men and women of faith in the first century, face persecution. We ask ourselves, how is it possible? To wake up every morning not knowing whether you're going to be hauled off to prison, your life's going to be ended, whether you're going to be beheaded, whether you're going to be attached to a pole, dipped in wax and burned. Just because somebody can do it. And they ask themselves this, and right in the middle of all of that, all these people are strong because of what they believed and they were one because they realized that the task ahead of them was never going to be as great as the power that was within them. They lived it, and it showed. Here we find our task is to be servants through whom others will hear the Word of God. And we and getting to a um, point that we know that our God is greater than the world's Satan. In church, we need to live that every, every single day of our life. I want to end with a verse of Scripture. I told you at the beginning, Ralph Waldo Emerson is credited with making that statement. People say, what a brilliant man he was to have the insight to say that. But like so many things, matter of fact, all things that are great in this world, I can go back and find it attributed to the Word of God. Let me give you an example here. Find in 1 John 4, verses 4 through 6. You ready for this? Little children... John often addresses, often addresses the kids that way, us. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. I'll get to that in a second. For, watch, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Where do you think Emerson got what he said? Here it is. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. Brother Andy mentioned about abortion and his prayer, and about the legality of marriage and the sanctity of marriage and what it's all about. Boy, we need to remember that, and this is exactly what that's talking about. They speak from a worldly standpoint, the world's going to listen to them and applaud them. They're from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Boy, that's true, isn't it? By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Why? Because we are in God. We are all about God, about His Word. Therefore, being about His Word, we know what the Word of God has to say. The reality is this. The them we overcome in this context are the false prophets. Now a false prophet can be he who prophesies something of a biblical nature that never comes to fruition because he's a false prophet. Or it can be someone who is totally against the Word of God, trying to alienate us from the Word of God or annihilate the Word of God altogether. It doesn't make any difference, but the word prophet means from Roer or roe, it means seer, someone that sees into the future. But Deuteronomy 18 says that seeing into the future comes from God Himself. And you get to Deuteronomy 18, 18, it's a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ where He says, I'll raise up a prophet like no other prophet, put my words in His mouth, the word He speaks is going to be directly from Almighty God. I believe that's a messianic prophecy. That's why Jesus, when we hold to His word, is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, John 14 and verse 6. But this is what we overcome, these ideas of 
of those people of the world. Satan is powerful and has influenced far too many for far too long. We all believe that, amen? He has. However, to overcome this, I would love. I've been at football games where there have been 70, 75,000 people in the stands. I look around and think to myself, I would love to preach to every one of these people right now. But the problem is, once they announce that, almost every one of that audience would leave. Isn't that sad? Wouldn't you love to see members of the Lord's body preaching to audiences of 70,000 and 100,000 people? I believe it can happen. But the only way it's going to happen is if our nation and the world's turned back towards God and the center and the interest of that is turned back towards God because until that happens, what you're going to continue to see is auditorium after auditorium with thousands upon thousands of people gathered to hear this feel-good type of sermon. And you have that as all, all around the world today. You're going to have that. You're going to have some places 20,000 people are gathered together, but they're not going to hear the truth. They're going to hear some warm, fuzzy thing to make them feel good. They're going to walk out of there and say, hey, everything is just fine, hunky-dory. Because a true challenge from the Word of God makes cowards out of most people. You know how I know that? Because the Bible tells us, Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14, let me go ahead and click on that last one here. Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14, that there are going to be few that are going to walk that narrow road. There are going to be many that walk that road to destruction. That tells me that most people don't care about listening to the truth. Let's never forget as Christians, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Maybe someone here today You've wanted to stand up for Almighty God maybe all of your life, all of your adult life, but you haven't done it. You need baptism for the mission of sins. Do you know it? Certainly God knows it, but you haven't done anything about it. Maybe you're letting friends hold you back, status hold you back, stubbornness hold you back, whatever it is. The Bible I read says, and I can preach this with certainty, that no one can enter into heaven on their own merit. All that will be in heaven will be, have done exactly the same thing because God shows no partiality. We all have to do the same thing. It's not my rules. Those are not my rules. It comes from the Word of God. If you have a need today, baptism, mission of sin, prayer for strength, won't you come as we stand and sing?